Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Restaurant Roundtable. I could not be more excited to pilot this series of virtual events today. We have an all-star panel of restaurateurs and innovators who are really changing the way that the industry thinks about compensation and tipping. Thank you. Welcome. I appreciate y'all taking some time out of your day to chat with us. For those of you all who are in the audience, I just want to relay a few quick housekeeping items before we kickstart the event. We will do our very best to get to audience questions if we have time at the very end. And of course, everyone is muted because we want to make sure that all of our panelists have the mic and the opportunity to chat. If you have any questions, just pop into the chat and a member of the Seven Shifts team will be there to assist. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to kick things off by just setting the stage and sharing a bit about what's happening in the restaurant industry regarding tipping. We all know news, headlines, data, you name it. We're going to frame why this conversation we're having is so, so important and so relevant. And then we'll dive into the panel. By uh, that time, I think y'all will be pretty sick of hearing from me. So I will kick it over to our operators and restaurateurs who are at the forefront of tipping strategies. We have a bunch of round table questions to ask, some specific questions to ask, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A at the end. Thanks in advance for taking a bit of time out of your day to join us. And let's get started. I'll start by first introducing myself so you understand who it is that's talking to you nonstop. My name is Corinne Watson. I'm the director of brand and communications here at Seven Shifts. I work behind the scenes with an amazing team of marketers to make sure that the Seven Shifts mission and products are communicated to the industry. I've worked in restaurant tech for just over two years. I absolutely love it. Prior to that, I was serving in communication roles at a few different software companies. I'm a foodie through and through. I was just raving about crispy lettuce before we went live today. I think being a foodie is a prerequisite to joining the Seven Shifts team. I actually just relocated from what I think is the barbecue capital of the world, Austin, Texas, to Dallas, Texas, which is why you've probably heard me say y'all six times during this presentation already. I hope no one's keeping count. But enough about me. Let's get into it. Let's set the stage. So. This slide is the result of just five minutes of browsing on Google News. I kid you not, five minutes. Whether you are a news reader or a news watcher or a news swiper or even a news ignorer, you've probably come across a ton of information about what's happening in our dear restaurant industry. The global economy, the North America economy are certainly facing very worrisome and energetic times. Of course, anything that affects consumers will also affect the way that they spend money and the way that they spend time, which for almost everyone is in restaurants. We're going to remain on this slide for just one moment to talk about four things. Bear with me. One are the diners. So during the pandemic, there was a lot of generosity that surfaced with diners because they wanted to help out their favorite restaurants. They used curbside delivery. They bought gift cards. They donated. But now due to the economic uncertainty and inflation, folks are tightening their belts, which means that they're a little bit more careful about how they choose to spend their money and how much they tip see in the data in just a moment. The second theme here is the restaurant staff. We know staffing shortages aren't going anywhere and restaurants have to work harder than ever to find and train and retain staff. So a big part of this is how restaurants can offer a, attractive compensation packages to staff, which again, we'll get to in just a moment. And then our, our third out of four themes on this slide as the restaurants, the folks that are in this room, this industry has razor thin margins. So restaurants often have to turn to tipping as a way to incentivize and compensate staff. But when a person is looking at a career in the restaurant industry versus other industries that might have more solid benefits and growth opportunities, how can restaurants stand out and attract staff? And we really make it known that restaurants can be a fruitful lifelong career. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fourth theme, which is the government. Every month, new legislator and laws get put into place regarding minimum wages, fair wages, workers' comp, workers' rights, you name it. It's a lot to keep up with, but it's really important for restaurants because even the smallest changes can ricochet into something that can really impact them and their bottom line. So that's the themes on this slide, and it would not be an intro presentation if I didn't throw some statistics at you as well. Okay, we're keeping it simple with just three. <laughs> there are a number of studies that have been done specifically by our friends over at Square that look into how much people are tipping when they dine out. And long story short, as I mentioned during the pandemic, the statistic rose, but now it's falling back down again because of economic uncertainty, which means that restaurant workers can't always rely on tips as a steady income source. 
So with this decrease in statistics, you might ask, since tip amounts are decreasing, is the minimum wage rising to match that deficit? The short answer is no, at least not federally. The federal minimum wage in the U.S. hasn't changed since 2009. That's not a typo. 2009, when COVID didn't exist, I think it was the, the swine flu. Barack Obama was president. I had bangs. It was a really long time ago. States of California and New York have independently raised their wages, but nothing has happened at a countrywide scale. Speaking of Cali and New York, just seven states out of the 50 states have instituted a minimum wage regardless of tips. So while we can cross our fingers that others will follow suit, we can't necessarily rely on the government to pilot too much change here. All right. So to put things into a visual perspective, just a quick map of all the states and their policies around tipping. The dark blue states represent states that have to pay a full state minimum wage before tips. The medium blue states require restaurants to pay a tip credit and minimum wage. And then the light blue, including my dear old Texas, have a minimum wage of $2.13 per hour. And then it's up to the restaurant workers to, to make the tip on top of that. I don't think that's necessarily enough for people to get by. But let's pull out of the history lesson and hop into the panel. I'm so excited to have such a star-studded lineup for this inaugural virtual restaurant roundtable. These operators and restaurateurs are at the forefront of tipping culture, as I mentioned, and they each have their very own unique perspective of what it means to properly compensate staff. As typically with panels, I like to have the panelists introduce themselves because I don't think I can really give it justice. So if y'all wouldn't mind coming off mute and telling us a little bit about you and your role and your background, we can start with Senia putting you in the hot seat. Thanks, Corinne. Hi, my name is Ksenia Adams, and I'm a tech lead for Human Capital Systems at Union Square Hospitality. I've been with the company for almost nine years. Throughout the years, we a few different heads, which allowed me to work with almost all of our businesses. And I started as a dining room manager at Myelino. I am a certified HR professional, so I was on HR team for the last, I want to say, three to five years. And in my current role, I oversee all people systems, seven shifts being one of them. So very excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Let's go over to Gavin. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Gavin Casey. I'm the chef and founder of Swanee Hospitality in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I have a couple of restaurants here, Spoon and Stable, Demi, Bakery, and Mara, which is in the fourth season. Just opened about five months. So I'm trying to I had a, had a third child at least five months old, and it was I had the baby the same week we opened the restaurant. So I guess I should never forget enough. We uh, had Spoon and Stable for eight years. I moved here from New York City. I was previously the chef at Cafe Blue de Vio with Danielle. Awesome. Am I the only person who hears Gavin a little in and out with the echo? No, it's I not... was feeling the same way. It was kind okay. of cutting in and out for the audio. We'll, we'll see if it fixes itself, but if not, we might have to do some live troubleshooting. Gee, hey, you want to do an intro? Yeah. Hi, my name is Jihei. I'm the chef at Miss Kim Korean Restaurant in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're part of Zingerman's community of businesses. I think the hospitality group itself has been in business for 40 years, but my restaurant has been in business for six years. And we've never taken a tip credit since we opened. So we can talk about that when we get to it. Awesome. Kelly, over to you. Hi, my name is Kelly Phillips. I'm co-founder of Destination Unknown Restaurants. We have three restaurants in the D.C. area. We have Ghost Burger, which is our fast, fancy concept. We have Destino, which is a high-end Mexican restaurant. And we have Las Gemelas, which is a modern talk. I really love food and hospitality, and that's why I got into the restaurant business. But um, lately, my focus has definitely been people and making sure that we have an equitable work environment and that we're constantly looking at the future, how restaurants can run and be better for the people that work in them. Amazing. And wrapping us all up, Jordan. Hey, everyone. Great to be here and meet everyone as well. I'm the CEO at Seven Shifts. So for those that don't know, Seven Shifts is a team management platform um, with a core focus that was kind of built around scheduling and communication at its roots. Really born out of an idea of when I was working for my dad at some QSR restaurants he was running. And uh, my grandparents also ran restaurants. So grew up working in them, a uh, passionate problem solver, and uh, became very passionate about solving those problems specifically in the restaurant industry. And uh, now Seven Shifts is used by you know, one in 15 restaurant workers in the US, over 35,000 restaurants. 
And uh, we get to chat with amazingly smart folks and build great products that help them as it relates to just, you know, daily team related things around just schedule management, engagement, culture, and uh, compliance as well, which is a growing topic and concern for many operators around the country. So very excited to be here. Awesome. I love it. Well, as mentioned, all of our panelists come from pretty diverse backgrounds and have pretty diverse opinions on the concept of tipping. Starting with Kelly, I was doing a little bit of research into destination unknown restaurants. And aside from pinning every single concept on my Google Maps, <laughs> I, I discovered that you were recently named one of Washington Business Journal's 40 under 40. Congratulations. Your restaurants also eliminated tipping in 2020 and instead opt for salary and customer service fee. I found a, a picture of President Biden uh, giving Las Gamalas the first restaurant revitalization fund, which is really neat. All that to say, in your restaurants, how do you keep staff incentivized to be top performers without the addition of tips? I understand that y'all have a pretty unique bonus structure. Yeah, so I think you have to start with the assumption that uh, servers, bartenders, people in restaurants, they want to be good at their jobs, right? They, they want to be here. They don't want to give bad service. You have to hire happy people that want to be there. Any other industry, you're there to do your job. There's not an incentive necessarily besides, you know, some jobs have bonuses. But I think it starts with hiring. So hire happy people. And then, yes, we incentivize people. So we do uh, monthly bonuses for great reviews um, and, you know, um, having a a review, like a score that you, that you hold each month. And so that really works for us. Honestly, that's more of like a point of pride for them. It's not a huge amount of money. It, it matters to them. It makes them proud. They want to give good service. They want to be good at their jobs. And to me, you know, that's just more for bragging rights for them. They certainly hit their bonus every month, but it is the type of standard that they have set. It's just like any other industry, I think. You want to hire people that want to do a good job. I wonder if there's some like geographical weight that being in the Washington DC area holds when it comes to like either work ethic or, or people taking pride in, in what they do. Super interesting. The next question that I had was for Gavin, who has been in the restaurant industry since he was 24. So what, two years? Just kidding. Yeah, uh, about that. <laughs> and then you have a soon to be published cookbook that you just wrapped up your tour for. So you've spent many, many years in the backup house. I'm curious to hear from you, how has the concept of tipping changed over your years in the industry or your perception of it even? Before I go, is the sound still off? I think you're good. Okay, great. I've been in this business for since I was 24, which is actually longer than two years. Being in the kitchen the whole time and being in the back of the house gave me a, a great amount of specs for what it means to, for what it meant to be like in the front of the house. And so I spent a lot of time studying and trying to understand what it meant to be a server, what it meant to be a manager, and really how to connect with the guest. When I understood that tipping was a major part of that, it, it inspired me to do more research to understand how to be better on, on what that looks like. Does it sound still okay? It's not as okay. bad as it was before, so you're good. So as we opened our restaurants here in Minneapolis, you know, I, I could see that there was a difference between what we were doing in our restaurant, what other restaurants were doing. And as we started to take tipping away and replace it with a hospitality chart, what we have now and have had for many years, we've seen retention. We've seen happy people, which Kelly was talking about. And it's amazing what happens when you give people that incentive to stay happy. And that's not just for the dining room. All of our restaurants are built with the mind of an open kitchen. So our team can also see in the kitchen what the guests are, are feeling. Because I can go to the dining room and I can talk to the guests every night and I can see their smiles. I love it. But I also want the garmage cook to see their smiles. And I want them to understand that the salad or the bison tartare or the hamachi that they've worked so hard to make for that guest is valued and that their job is valued. And so that's been really important. And all of that is part of the ethos of hospitality. You know, the word restaurant comes from the word restoration. 
to be restored. And in order to really restore who we are and what we want, we have to be able to give that to others. Thank you for sharing, Gavin. That really um, struck a chord with me, especially in a time where a lot of restaurants are really clinging to technology. Like we still need to be restorative and be at the heart of restaurants. Um, we'll get into that in a bit because I do have a hot question for Jordan. But before that, I wanted to chat with uh, Jihei and Senia. Both of y'all's concepts have had like a pivot to tip pooling or to just different tipping strategies. Um, Jihei, do you want to chat through what that has been like? Absolutely. I have a different background than Chef Gavin because I started at a not at a hospitality industry and then coming into the restaurant. Tipping is an anomaly. If you like look at the rest of the industry, it's a restaurant industry does that. You don't go to Home Depot and go like, you help me find this painting tape. So I'm going to make sure that you're making a living wage. <laughs> you don't do that at other industries. So I thought that was sort of odd. And I when I was uh, building the restaurant, I started working with this uh, nonprofit called uh, RAISE. Uh, they work for not necessarily elimination of tipping, but uh, elimination of sub-minimum wage and tip credit. Uh, so we initially opened the restaurant six years ago with no tips at all. And at the time, service charge was very rare. So we also did not have service charge. Everything was built into the menu price. And there was no tip line on the credit card charge and the staff are on a uh, living wage for our county. And that proved to be quite challenging. <laughs> there is a sort of a, a comfort level with doing, continuing to do what you used to do. As an American public, when you go out to dine, tipping is the norm. And then if you are a server, then getting tips at the end of the night or even at the uh, at the end of the week is a norm. Everybody sort of understands it, even though it's quite complicated if you dig into it a little more. We had a, a little bit of pushback, and that's after we did a lot of uh, conversations and educations with the staff and the customers. I want to point out, like, part of the challenge was that building everything into the menu price for an Asian restaurant was met with pushback that an ethnic restaurant needed to be a little cheaper. There was an added challenge because we are a Korean restaurant. After a while, we started hearing from the guests that they understand that we pay living wage benefits. They understand that the staff were not taking tip credit, but they still want to be able to leave a little tip. So much already has been published for the origin of tipping being rooted in slavery or the remnants of slavery. So I was against it philosophically, but when I talked to the staff that they were all for it, if I had allowed them to take a few more dollars home and I thought, you know, I shouldn't be the one standing in front of people taking more money home. So we didn't switch to tip credit, but we switched to allowing tips and then having that shared across all the hourly staff. And then we put everything through the payroll so they don't have to do the calculations. And I think that was working a little better, but I also needed to do a lot of research in what uh, state of Michigan allows because some states do not allow sharing. Some states have tight regulations of who can share and who, <clears throat> who cannot share what you can call service charge and what you can call tips. We considered putting everybody on salary, but state of Michigan also has... Uh, regulations on who can be salaried at a restaurant and who cannot be and what that looks like. So for us, this looked like a, a decent way to go that allowed us to continue doing what we believe is to be providing equitable workplace and equitable pay by making sure front of the house and the back of the house are on the same page in terms of pay, as well as understanding that both departments are providing guest experience and then a clarity of information on how one gets paid and how the tips are divided. Um, pandemic was challenging in so many ways, but pandemic was helpful in a way that because we were not doing tip credit and certain amount of wage was guaranteed with the base pay that was way above even regular minimum wage. And because the tipping and how it's shared was really clear and staff understood that. And that gave them a little more stability during the pandemic. During the pandemic, the retention was actually really great. We didn't really have to deal with the great exodus of the staff leaving the industry. We didn't have to deal with that more than before the pandemic. Now, I think... Um, just guests, at least in our area in general, are more 
informed and open to tip sharing or service charge. So, so far coming out of the pandemic with the retention and the system that we tried many different ways is working well for us. And it sounds to me like with with Ms. Cam and then also Kelly with Destination Unknown, it's almost a marketing strategy in and of itself. Like, yes, you are you are really bettering the lives of your employees, but it's also a way to get in front of your your community to say like, hey, we are we're changing things. Come check us out. See how happy our staff is, et cetera. That's sort of a happy accident because. I don't actually think of it as bettering the staff's uh, lives. I think of it more as like doing the minimum that any employer can do is uh, provide living wage and an equitable work environment. And we also do a lot of other stuff besides this that the community does understand that maybe we are a little different than your average tipped restaurant on Main Street. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And I, I appreciate that correction too. It is the bottom line. It is what restaurants should do. So Senia, can you chat a little bit about USHG's like way into tipping and then way out of tipping and that whole journey that I'm sure a lot of us have heard about already? Yeah, thank you. Um, at Union Square Hospitality Group, the model that we believe activates sustainably profitable businesses is the one that starts by taking care of your people first. And we've heard that from other panelists as well, right? Happy people. And in USAG language, we call it the virtual cycle of enlightened hospitality. So the elimination of tipping in 2015, and I was actually a part of one of the restaurants then, and I remember it as a very exciting experience that we had to go through. So that was one of the tactics we implemented in an effort to further fuel the cycle of enlightened hospitality and learned a great deal throughout that effort. As we were reopening from COVID, from the pandemic, I wouldn't say we went back to tipping. I would rather say we took a step forward with a slightly different model and we did implement tipping for our dining room teams, but we kept the back of house revenue share program for our kitchen teams, where regardless of what position you work in the kitchen, you get a certain percentage of revenue earned which allows for our people to earn consistent and fair wages in addition of the wide array of the benefits that we offer. Our ultimate goal is for the tips to be split between everyone so that both kitchen and dining room team members can benefit when someone has a really great experience in the restaurant, right? And so this will obviously require a big shift in public and um, we need to persuade state and federal lawmakers to make that change happen. But this is something that would be really great because I don't think that tips is the problem. I think it's the way they're being distributed. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. Last but not least, I know, Jordan, we went back and forth on, on whether or not you could be a panelist because being a restaurant operator looks a lot different than being someone who is the CEO of a restaurant technology. But I think that your experience chatting with restaurateurs day in and day out actually gives you a really great look into all the different strategies, all different themes. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you can share with us today about like what's really sticking out in these conversations with restaurants about tipping and compensation. Yeah, I think it's very similar to what everyone has just said here, which is that there is kind of a shift that we're seeing within our base of restaurateurs and operators that we work with, there are kind of these different segments of, hey, this is so bad. It's so hard. It's tough. And granted, the industry is, you know, obviously very challenging. And, you know, there's a lot of amazingly smart and hardworking people, but there's these folks that are adapting and looking for new ways to get out of those situations. There are folks that are just kind of stuck and just not doing a whole lot about it. So we try and focus on the folks that are doing really great things and then try and share those stories in hopes that we can raise the water for everyone. And some of the stories that we've seen that that we're gravitating to is, I mean, even just kind of looking back on the survey we did with our 4,000 workers around why they left their jobs. This was like a survey we just did in the past year, which was number one reason was pay. The second one was lack of flexibility in terms of just when they can work. And the third one, if you were under the age of 25, is going back to school. And if you're over 25, it was lack of career growth or a craze for managers and understanding like the training side of things and how you can be better and whether it's at a position in the restaurant, it was typically the case. So 
I think that a lot of these folks are taking those very seriously. So if pay was a big thing, they're doing things about that. At Bar Taco, I always like to share the story of Scott, the CEO there, where the pandemic hit. Unfortunately, they couldn't have servers. But what he did was implement some very lightweight technology, right? Pay at the table, but took all that savings and pooled it to the back of house. And so he was quoted for saying, if you want a job as a dishwasher for $45,000 a year, you can make that here at Bar Taco as a dishwasher stories like that people are like scratching their heads they're like how is that possible and with talking with some of these people they just find ways to make it possible and so I think it really has to do with how much you care to address the things that you know are challenging and a big part of that is listening to your staff and getting that feedback because why are people leaving have you done an exit interview it's like no like 90 percent of the industry does not do exit interviews they have no idea why people are leaving or also understanding what makes your people tick. Like, why are they here? Are they seeing this as a six months journey or do they want to do something more long-term? Do they want to become a chef and crane under someone really great? And I think that understanding that shows that you care. It also gives you better predictability around your business. So I would say there's a multitude of things that we're seeing, but at the core level, it's like you care enough to understand and then how you understand and then what you do with that information to kind of make it a reality. Yeah, I, th- I think that there's a lot that can be done in terms of like skills training or education in order for people to realize that like working at a restaurant is not something that is just a flash in the pan. It's something that can be really fruitful as a career and that will help with employee retention as well. The next question that I had was a, a round table question, um, which is if I were to walk out the door and decide to start a restaurant and I was putting a magnifying glass onto my tipping strategy, uh, what would each of y'all give to me as like a word of wisdom or advice, aside from listen to your staff? I I can go. I would say you have to really understand your state's law because I can do what I can do because I'm in Michigan. I wouldn't be able to do it in New York because they don't allow tip share across the department. Advocating for your lawmakers would be sort of a backseat one. But another thing that I want to say is that like the restaurants are for profit businesses. We're not nonprofit. We're not activists, even though we can be in our everyday policies. So my advice would be like figure out what your uh, state allows and then do a PL and look at the long term. Because if I looked at a, a first year or a second year PL, I don't think I would have jumped in and try to go against the flow and take on all the financial burden. It's only when we did the three-year plan and looked at what else is not contributing to the bottom line that we decided to focus on, like really focus on marketing and top line sales before we start cutting the labor cost or go back on taking tip credits. So I would say long-term PL and know your state. Um, I can go next. I would say um, do the math, figure out what you can afford to pay people, because that's going to be your biggest challenge now is not how great is your food, but can you actually afford to pay people what they need to make? You need to be actively managing your labor, know what those numbers are, and just constantly be aware of that. And think about operating the way that any other retail establishment is currently operating. That's a good one. Thanks, Kelly. Gavin, all you. Sure. I would just say, don't be afraid of technology. You know, there's a lot of tools out there that allow you to be successful and help you manage numbers, help you manage overtime. And so much of our profession has been afraid of technology for so long. And it's really hindered a lot of people. And I think through COVID, if you embraced what technology can do for you, you came out ahead. If you sort of went into a hole and you said, I still don't want to figure out all this stuff new, it's still a lot of catch up. So I would say kind of embrace that. And then, of course, have, have a good advisor and labor attorney to help you. You're not supposed to know that. You're not the expert. They are. I love it. Anything to add there? Jordan, Senia? I agree with everything that was said, but keep in mind all of your stakeholders, right? What impact it's going to have, obviously, on your employees, your purveyors, your investors, as well as bottom line. And once you do make that decision to make a change, just be transparent at every step. Make sure people understand what exactly you're doing, why you're doing that, 
how are they going to win in this situation? And what helped us uh, be successful when we rolled out hospitality included a few years ago, keeping the communication open was very helpful. So I, I hear about like keeping communication open and doing exit interviews. How can we hear more from restaurant staff? Like, is there any techniques or tools that y'all have used to solicit feedback that you found really helpful? I'm going off script, but I want to double click on this. Shift feedback on seven shifts. We've been using that. That, that, that was not a plug, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> we have been using this. Love it. Yeah, I think it's also about building trust and having a conversation with the team about what's going on and how you want to grow and what that looks like. You know, one of the things that I consistently am reminded of is that we, as the leaders of the restaurant, they're looking to us to lead. And so as a result, we need to step up and show a bit of vulnerability through that leading because we don't always know the answers either. And it's okay to say that. And I think when you show that, create that trust to the team with the team, the exit conversation that you have with them is more organic and it's more fruitful versus I hate this place, I'm out of here, or whatever, whatever. You want to be able to create something. It doesn't mean that everyone can leave your restaurant and think it's the best place they ever worked. That's okay too. I don't cook for people every night and they walk out of my restaurant. It was the best meal they ever had. It's okay too, but I, I certainly try. Practically, we try to create a culture where communication and failing while you're trying is okay. And so like safe environment for communicate and then sharing a lot of information. We try to do it in smaller increments. So having a quick checkout conversation at the end of the shift and then having a weekly meeting rather than like a yearly all staff meeting or a quarterly all staff meeting. That helps a lot because that gets everybody in practice of just talking about things. And we also practice open book finance. So all the numbers are open except for individual pay information. So then when we talk about money or when we talk about income or when we talk about cost, it just becomes part of the everyday sort of chit chat. And having that is super helpful in getting staff feedback as well, because we're opening up and doing vulnerability, even in numbers and asking them to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, I think since we're moving tipping, we really changed our work culture. So I feel a lot more comfortable having these conversations with people on my team. We have all of our full-time bartenders and bartenders are on salary. When they need to give me feedback, they come to me as if they're a manager coming to another manager. Those communication lines are more open and transparent than they ever have been. And they're more likely to want the best for the restaurant. And so that's crazy for me because like I have this team that trusts me and I trust them. And when I started in restaurants, it wasn't like that. It was always a, a relationship that was kind of broken. And limiting tipping and creating stability and trust has really changed the way our restaurants feel. A, a very common theme in most of the responses here is very different than what like restaurants are used to, which is to go as quickly as possible. It sounds to me like in order to get really great valuable feedback, you have to slow down and you have to make time for weekly meetings instead of monthly meetings and you need to conduct exit interviews. And that's just some, a really great reminder for all of us here. Cool. Yeah, something that I would I would also add just to you know everyone's comments, which which are awesome. I think that that point of that resounding sentiment around trust in so many ways, the hospitality industry, a lot of the times they think of themselves as kind of like a different industry, but it's like a business at the end of the day. And there are all these great practices that businesses employ around people and, and culture and, and how they do things that could be borrowed that are industry agnostic. I think about that element of like, you're building a team, you know, the team is, is running this business and that trust part. If I think about the five dysfunctions of a team book, it's one of the, our favorite books here at Seven Shifts, which is. You know, if you don't have that bottom layer, which is trust, you can't have conflict. But once you have that trust, you can have the conflict and then you can have that commitment around what you aligned on. And then you have the accountability. And then the top of the pyramid is the results you're trying to drive. But all of those things kind of need to happen. And trust is the underlying foundation of all of it. And I think that that's a really important thing that I, I heard from everyone chatting here as well. 
that applies to just life in general. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I got some feedback the other day that in, if there wasn't trust established, I would not have liked it or appreciated it. But since there was trust established, like it's a great way to build yourself up. All right. So we are just about at time for the seated questions, but it looks like we have just a few that have popped into the chat while we were all talking. So I'm going to just spitball these and whoever wants to catch them and answer them, let's just do it that way and, and keep it fun. Sam says, has anyone implemented a tip pool after never having one? Did any of the staff react negatively? If so, how did you handle that? Anyone want to take it? I guess we, we sort of, I mean, because we weren't taking tips, but then when we started taking tips, then we implemented tip pool. So that's an easier change than having been a traditional tip credit place and then turning it into a tip pool restaurant. But we started by talking a lot about it and we made sure at first the staff were able to just talk it out amongst themselves with the help of a supervisor and a manager, but not with me in it, in the, in the room. So they feel a little more comfortable chatting off the shoot. And then I think we had uh, several conversations with the current staff and came up with the system that we have now, which is we accept tips and we divide it up across all front of the house and back of the house. And we divide it up by the number of hours you worked. So in a week, if one person worked 20 hours, one person worked 40 hours, person who worked 40 hours will get double, exactly double of the 20 hour. And we didn't put in any complicated systems like, oh, if you're a supervisor, you get a little more percentage. But we did that from the feedback from the staff that they didn't want anything complicated. They wanted to be able to understand what their pay was and how it's divided up. If you t took on more responsibility or if you took on ordering, the raises came from the base pay, not from the tip pool. The staff reaction was actually positive for us because we were going from base pay to base pay plus tips. So they were just getting more money, which I think would be different if you're going from a tipped. It's a lot more complicated to go from like a tip credit restaurant to tip pool restaurant because one department in front of the house will be having this idea that they're losing a bunch of income to give it to the back of the house. So I'm going to let other people answer that change. Yeah, makes sense to me. Well, thanks for walking us through that. There are two, two other questions that came through. One of them I can answer really quickly. Catherine says, I'm from Canada. Will there be a round table for us in the North? We face the same challenges. Absolutely. This is the inaugural virtual restaurant round table, but we can certainly make time for other ones throughout 2023. So more to come there. And then Thomas, Hey, Thomas, he asks, do any of the restaurants share tip pooling with front of house and back of house staff? If so, what percentage is shared with back of house? It varies, right? Can anyone here share some percentages that they've used in the past? I can just say that in New York, we unfortunately are not allowed to share. And even for dining room employees, there's an 80-20 rule where 80% of your scheduled shift, you have to be guest facing to be in a tip eligible role. And, you know, Sharing tips one day amongst everyone would be the ideal state. It's very similar in DC. I will say that we certainly try to pay as much as we can to back of house. I do think that system still is like the next challenge. We need to figure out how back of house can be paid more because they're incredibly skilled and we don't want to lose them. We don't want them to exit the industry. So I think my ideal restaurant would be one where everyone is just on salary, but I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> It's the same in Minnesota. We're not able to share the tips. I want to add for my restaurant, because Michigan allows sharing of tips, as long as you're not a salaried manager, so <laughs> if you're hourly, then you can share in. So all the hourly employees share in. They both front of the house and the back of the house have the same starting wage, base pay, and same rate of tip share because... We wanted to keep it simple. I, I will also add that if I were to redesign this again, then I may consider calling it service charge rather than tips because the word tip is very loaded and there are comp complicated laws around a lot of states. Service charge, however, I think it, it gives you a little more wiggle room on how you split that amongst from people who share that. So interesting how it gets down to the, the language used. Thanks for sharing. All right, 
I have one last question, which is for Jordan. As the leader as a tech, of a technology company that benefits from restaurants using tips, how do you draw the line between what's good for technology versus what's good for restaurateurs? Is there a happy medium? And what does that happy medium kind of look like? I wrote this question as a... As yeah, a no, it's a complicated one. You gave me a hard one here. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think like, uh, so kind of like understanding that intersective, like what's good for tech and what's good for operators, right? I think I very much subscribe to, you know, what Danny Meyer talks about, which is really like, <clears throat> how can we leverage technology to augment the hospitality experience? I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think that <clears throat> we all appreciate the industry so much. And I think a large part of that appreciation is that people centric feeling that you get when you are greeted and you have a great experience and, and you, you have that hospitable feeling. And that'll be dependent, I think, on what type of establishment you're eating at to what depth that goes to. We need to be really cognizant of like understanding the type of, you know, I think restaurant that in our case that we're serving and what types of things like we think augment that experience. But I also think operators, it's really on operators too, to be like, you know, what experience do you want to drive for your guests and for your workers and hitting that happy medium? I don't think there's a perfect answer here. I think it's very dependent on the the operator themselves and their team of where they want to draw that line. But any technology should, should certainly be value add and ROI driven around either driving results for the business from a revenue perspective or retention metrics because the cost to hire a worker in this industry is, is still very costly, thousands of dollars and you know, tens of thousands if you look at manager hires. Being ROI driven and understanding where you want to strike that balance is, is totally in the eye of the, of the operator where they want to land. And, and how much of their like, mission and soul do they want to transfer over to their technology too? I think Gavin put it nicely where we can't be afraid of technology but we also still need to be like hospitable and friendly and a warm and welcoming environment i was served a meal from a, a robot in dallas last week and it was fun but it was odd <laughs> so we'll get there all right yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know just in, in your comment gavin about adopting like, i'd be curious to understand like where that threshold and that line was for you and saying like hey we need to adopt more like where did you kind of hit that balance or how did you think about that a lot of it starts for me, the fact that we call it an industry and we need to be calling it a profession. And in order to embrace a profession, we would have to embrace all of that entitles that which that's technology, human interaction, equity of pay, all of the things that any profession would take into consideration and with a lot of sincerity. You know, we are a for business, which has been said on this panel. I think when people hear that term, they hear it as a selfish term. But for profit, for me, it's also for making sure that everybody who works for us can make the payments that they need to make to live the life that they choose, that they want to live. And that's the responsibility that we have. So a lot of embracing this is also embracing the fact that we need to remove the idea that we're an industry and embrace that we are a profession. You are all professionals at what we do. Yeah, love that. Great. Very well said. That's a quotable. We can't call it industry. It's called a profession. That's not on the back of your cookbook, Gavin. Maybe for the second print. <laughs> exactly. All righty. Well, we're just at time. And before we wrap up, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, times a thousand to all of our wonderful panelists. It's always a little bit of a gamble joining in on these when they haven't been done before. So thank you for bringing yourselves and your backgrounds and your unique opinions. I can't wait to keep in touch with all of y'all. I would be remiss if I didn't plug something, right? What's a, what's a panel without a pitch at the end? I want to make sure that everyone here has the chance to share anything that they have coming up. I know that we have cookbook release, any new locations opening, anything that we can plug at the very end of our call today. Otherwise, I can just do mine. Well, I think there's a book, a cookbook, certain book cookbook that's coming out, Korean, if I'm not mistaken. Our, our book is, well, fortunately for us, the first print is sold out. So you can't even buy it. I can't even plug it. <laughs> and gee, hey, I'm also, uh, I've met Ari before from Zingerman's. Like super, super amazing, amazing person. And you guys also have a lot of, or like Zingerman's specifically, if you're part of that family, has a lot of literature as well. I mean, Ari's a very avid writer. Is there anything like about that, that that you can speak to? 
Oh, I would say you can buy Ari's book or you can go to our business website. It's called zingtrain.com. They have a lot of free resources <laughs> that you can yeah. check out before purchasing a book. This is like an anti-plug. <laughs> yeah, go go check out the website. They will tell you about shift notes to SOPs to open book finance, all that good jazz. And I think they have some sort of a virtual panel another one similar to this one coming up so yeah zingtrain.com is what i would recommend good resources awesome awesome all righty well for those of y'all who are still on the line if you haven't checked out the tip jar from seven chips maylee is going to throw up a quick call to action button where you can check it out it is our one-stop shop for all knowledge education research and comics about tipping so Go ahead and check it out if you'd like. And if you have any feedback on today's panel, my email is corinne.watson at sevenchips.com. I'd love to hear what you thought of it and how we can improve it for the future. We'll see you for the next virtual restaurant roundtable. Thanks. Awesome. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.